And look, I, there you are. I have never been so happy to have something canceled on me. <laughs> Seriously, I, I drove all the way across the bridge, got to where I was going, and then was told that the meeting was canceled the day before. Oh. So <laughs> I'm glad I was up to... Uh, I actually watched a little bit of the recording from uh, Klaus's meeting, uh -huh. which I found really interesting. Um, yeah. <laughs> cool. Love to hear your thoughts. Hey, Gil. Through the morning. He's still pre-literate pre this morning. Uh, then I'll keep talking. That's yeah. why I stopped. <laughs> Um, you know, yesterday was a great, was a great meeting and I like process as I speak, like that's, that's how I work. And so because some of those ideas started four years ago and they've constantly evolved depending on the situation and who I saw out there, I forgot some of, like you had asked me like why it had to be the two things. And I forgot the importance of being able to actually design and play within the video game that was being created. So like, you know, some of us in this space, if we wanted to be able to go in and help design the room, cause I was thinking it's really about reimagining um, and it ties into education and I'll wait till my check-in to tell you. Cool, cool, more. thank you. No, that's great. Um, already got me thinking about so many things. <laughs> hey Pete, hey John. Uh, today uh, is going to be the peak of our latest heat dome in Portland. Uh, it's supposed to hit 106 or 107 today. So. Fortunately, somebody invented air conditioning some years ago. But yeah. Um, well, I'd like to wait for a couple more people to join in and then start a, a round of check-ins. Um, and in the meantime, um, I was going to find a poem. Here, I think this one. Um, yeah, why not? It's not, it's not the it's not the happiest poem in the world, but uh, it's a it's an interesting poem, and it's it's titled. Let me just see if it's still on the page where it was. There we go. There we go. It's called "Lies I've Told My Three Year Old Recently," and it goes. It's a And it's by Raul Gutierrez. And it goes like this. Lies I've told my three-year-old recently. Trees talk to each other at night. All fish are named either Lorna or Jack. Before your eyeballs fall out from watching too much TV, they get very loose. Tiny bears live in drain pipes. If you are very, very quiet, you can hear the clouds rub against the sky. The moon and the sun had a fight a long time ago. Everyone knows at least one secret language. When nobody is looking, I can fly. We are all held together by invisible threads. Books get lonely too. Sadness can be eaten. I will always be there. Fabulous. I'll put it in the uh, in the Mattermost chat. <coughs> um, welcome everybody. Thank you for for being here for making room for Open Global Mind. 
which is a, a toothpaste, a floor wax, a movement, but not necessarily an organization. Um, we're still figuring out what we are and how we work. Uh, mm. Yeah, not all lies about the little bears in the drain pipes, you mean? <laughs> Um, and why don't uh, I, I, Pete? I have a feeling that, that you may not want to jump in first, but there's you have a lot of stuff uh, about emerging event sense making and other things going on. I would just love to start with you and then and then uh, work elsewise through the crowd. So uh, why don't you go first? Um, what would mind. you like to know? Um, what is the, in the spirit of checking in, what is this, the current state of, of emerging events, sense-making, and maybe also what do you wish would happen with it? And then we can go to other stuff. Um, so I've got a project called Emergent Event Sense-making. Uh, we've got a project, uh, a number of us. There's a um, chattel in Mattermost. Um, I picked up recently the idea that, well, the idea is that there's a lot of activity and confusion and looking for uh, looking for information, looking for answers that happens when we have a, a quick information event. Um, I'm, I'm drawn to quick information events. So the, the ones I can think of are 9-11, uh, what, what the heck just happened? Um, uh, maybe the, the start of COVID uh, around February, 2020. Um, another one was the game stop short squeeze. Like um, that was, a, a a vertical event or a, a event for only a, a certain people, uh, people who were watching the financial markets, but it was mind blowing. All of a sudden, the people on an internet forum um, caused uh, the gains and loss of billions of dollars uh, in a split second, more or less. Uh, in in you know in these the way these things go, and the most recent one is the Delta surge, uh, Delta coming in like a freight train. Um, starting uh, at the beginning of July. So I was watching it and thinking about it already in July. And uh, I didn't around to getting, well, actually I procrastinated a lot uh, for the first couple of weeks of July saying, I don't really want to get into this again because I've done, done COVID information. And, and I could see it happening that um, there were a bunch of people who didn't know it was, it, it was even going to happen. There were a bunch of people who were thinking that um, I want to, I want to honor the people who have, COVID uh, fatigue and pandemic fatigue, and let's just rip all our masks off and have a party, a grand old time. Uh, while I could see this freight train barreling down, bound, barreling down the tracks, um, you know, ready to just plow into society, thinking that was a, it's a really interesting thing to watch, um, a, a train wreck happening um, and information kind of going from small places out to everybody. So um, emerg uh, emergent event sense making is like kind of leaping into the breach of those uh, information events uh, that happen suddenly and have this weird sheer effect where uh, there's a few people that know a lot about what's going on and what's going to happen over the next, you know, uh, weeks or months. And then a lot of people slowly kind of learning that that information diffusion happening over, you know, over weeks or months. Um, uh, with the Delta surge thing, all I wanted to do is build some tools and processes to um, to leap into that breach a little bit better. And actually, only the very beginning beginning part of sense making, um, uh, kind of catching up with the information and starting to spread it around better. How how do you catch a lot of information all at once? How do you sort it into ways that people can maybe uh, downstream from that, uh, hopefully kind of also in real time, uh, people downstream from that can make sense of it. Um, so we've got some tools and processes, some observations, um, some learnings. Uh, one of my big learnings, um, and I, we all know this, um, but every time you experience it, it's pretty, pretty deep and profound. Um, just actually doing something um, instead of like thinking and being theoretical, um, uh, actually running the experiment um, and doing stuff. Uh, so for me, that was just grabbing a bunch of information off of the web and putting it someplace and going, what kind of information am I grabbing? Why am I grabbing this and not that? Um, why don't I try to grab something that's completely opposite of the stuff that I've been, you know, that I kind of just, if I'm not conscious about it, um, why don't I grab like really weird stuff? 
Um, and so a few of us have had some good conversations about the kinds of information and what kinds of tools that you want to just start making a little bit of like starting to make a collection rather than just uh, see everything flowing by and wondering what, you know, if you start to actually kind of collect it a little bit, what happens? What do we think? So I, there's not a lot more um, result than that. Um, uh, and I'll continue to kind of write it up. And uh, it's been a, it's been an interesting and um, uh, fruitful experiment. Um, I, another odd thing, of course, is that um, it's, it's gotten to be a weird world where billions of dollars um, flash changed hands in weeks or hundreds of thousands of people are sick and, and some of them, a significant chunk of them, um, they're going to be sick for the rest of their lives. They're, they're gonna have de deficiencies because of you know carelessness with masks and other people's carelessness with masks and other people's carelessness with public health and with the health of uh, polity. It's really an interesting thing to watch, and you know, I, after after the the last president and his administration, we kind of got forced to sit and watch while insane things happened. And it's really striking that you know, I, I still catch myself. It's it's like I I should be really upset about this, or I should be really, and you know, I I'm a lot better uh, at at being zen about things and going, you know. I totally get it. There are people in the world who you can tell them a truth, like uh, you're going to catch COVID and there's, you know, a, a decent chance, you know, much better than winning the lottery that you're going to be sick for the rest of your life. And they'll go, you know, America, my freedom. And, and you gotta, you kind of got to go, okay, cool. I get it. You know, um, you and your God and the, the gods of your politics, uh, you know, you, are more important to you than your, your life or your kids' lives or, or whatever. Okay, cool. I get it. Instead of, you know, um, Gil, uh, most startling or useful thing I've learned from the effort uh, is is probably just the, the practice of doing it, doing actually doing the, the uh, experiment rather than uh, cogitating about the theor theoretical nature of the experiment. I, there's a whole bunch of interesting things about Delta and, and what people do or don't believe and why they, you know, do or don't believe it or learn it. But, I, I don't know that any of that's particularly interesting. I we 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 know all of this stuff from um, from long time ago, cigarettes and seatbelts, and you know, and COVID in 2020, and um, you know, be belonging to belonging to a belief system is more important than your physical health uh, in many many made and it makes total sense if you think about it. That's you know how humans have survived for a long time, but we we all know those those lessons pretty much. Um, do you want to talk briefly about the roles that you were describing or envisioning in the middle of um, EES? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, um, and thanks for this little feature at Dre. Um, let me share my screen real quick and I'll show you a, a thing that I started working on. A description of the, what I call the intake system. Um, just something that could deal with a bunch of, um, mm -hmm. you know, bunch of material coming at you really fast. Uh, so um, I ended up calling, we, we started off with, hey, let's just post a bunch of links. And it turns out that, well, you post a link and then you post some information around it, like a title or a thought. And then it's like, well, sometimes you post um, a quote from somebody or sometimes you make an observation about something. Here's, here's a scientific study that has a surprising result or something like that. And so those are, those are what I'll, we ended up posting links, but also different kinds of information. So I ended up calling those exhibits uh, so far. So people who grab those exhibits and put them someplace are called evidence collectors and they put them in an intake stream and there's different intake streams. Uh, you use the one that you like instead of the one that everybody else thinks you should use. Um, and then uh, there's an intake bot uh, that um, looks at your uh, beginning proto exhibit kind of and decorates it a little bit. It can add dates and times and uh, it can grab stuff off the web if there's links in your in your exhibit. Um, so then uh, an investigator comes along a little bit later um, and uh, the intake bot has set up 
um, the exhibit better in the evidence database, but the investigator is really the one that can take it apart a little bit and say this one is connected to that one, or this is actually three or four different things. Let me make three or four uh, separate exhibits. Um, one of the things that the investigators do is uh, connect what I call the short narrative. The original name for this was narrative because it made sense to me, but um, uh, it, it starts to be like, Pete, you're trying to make too much sense of this. So the idea of a short narrative is, is a pretty simple thing. It's like um, vaccination is good, vaccination is bad. Um, I don't get enough oxygen if I'm wearing a mask. Uh, you know, all those, those kinds of simple kind of short statements of when people say something, they, they a lot of times they'll, they'll, it, they'll demonstrate something to you, but they won't actually say what they mean by it. So this is just meant to capture a little bit of meaning, mostly to classify it, not, not to make sense of it yet. Um, and then later in the, the stream, there's going to be curators and narrators that tell the story of the evidence that's been collected and what, what you can see the stories out of it. So that's about as far as I've got with this. Um, this obviously needs some diagrams and many more paragraphs of, of explanation. Um, that, that's where I am. And, and it's interesting to note that this system is pretty complicated and has a lot of richness and a deep schema. And my initial thinking about what this system would be is like, well, just post some links in a Mattermost channel or in a factor stream and we're good to go. And it's like, yeah, okay, that's not, not actually what's, what needs to go on. So just this little front end of data collection has a lot of richness and, and complexity and things like that. And, and also stuff that people do not deal with. Like um, uh, what did somebody say when um, they posted 40, you know, a 40 tweet, tweet st uh, storm um, and there are a bunch of replies to it. And some of those are PDFs and some of those are links to um, data dashboards that are gonna be changing every day and stuff like that. How do you, how do you capture that as an exhibit, you know, rather than it's not a link or it's not a link to all 40 things. It's, it's actually a, a really rich and complex data object, which I, we don't really deal with that kind of richness and complexity. How, how do I get, make sure that I can see this in the future when Twitter's, you know, maybe changing, Facebook is maybe changing, Facebook maybe won't let me see this unless I'm logged in, all that kind of stuff hard and complex. Thank you. Billy? Yeah, Pete, that, that's all fabulous. I, do, I wanted to just mention, you probably remember Jamie Joyce from Society Library. I've seen her internal process. It's, it has a lot of similarities. Um, and at some point, it, when if you ever have a bandwidth, it, it might be good to compare and contrast and see if there's anything y'all could inspire from each other. I'll try and remember to share this video with her um, you know, when it gets posted, uh, but just wanted to kind of bring that up. Yeah. And thank also you. I have some researchers working for me on Golibot and Golibot's currently working on the vaccine. Would it be cool to have them in that process somewhere? Um, if it's, if it's useful and valuable to them. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I love more participation in this project because part of the, part of the, the experiment is how wild and woolly can the participation get and can we still kind of help maintain order somehow in it? Yeah. So I think the area that would that would really be helpful in it is that kind of the um, taking the information that's come in and it's 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 probably at that kind of narrative level and then um, so we'd be putting them in Dollybot. So that would be one of the narratives, um, which is kind of a mapping of, of like that, for your example. That would be awesome. Yeah. Um, so I'll work with them. We'll figure out the best way to, I'll get them in the chat and we'll figure out how to coordinate. Thank you. Are you, are you architecting Gullybot to be able to be able at some point to, to answer the question? So what should I do about the Delta variant? For example, somebody comes in and types that to Gullybot. Is that, is that asking way too much or is that like where you're aiming? No, that's the, well, what to do about it. Um, Gullybot uh, is in the space where you have a specific proposal. So right now it's, should I personally take the vaccine, right? So it helps people walk through that. But then later on, if someone says, oh, we should, um, we should, do a mask mandate or we should uh, require vaccines or something like that. That, that kind of specific decision is where Golibot is. 
that kind of outer out, outer process of brainstorming and uh, coming up with the proposals is, is kind of out, outside the scope at the moment. Thanks. But yeah, if someone has a question like that, um, later on being able to search, you know, uh, Google or Gullybot, hopefully they'd run across it and uh, and and find themselves better informed and be able to participate in that discussion. Cool, thank you. I put the links to the two channels that Pete has set up for this in the chat in our channel on Mattermost. Uh, and does anybody else have any questions or comments or suggestions for Pete on this? Um, Doug. Yeah, it's it's a it's an alternative model. I have to frame this a little bit. I've been working with a group that uh, is historical. It was the group of people that worked with Al Gore and the first Clinton administration on a project called Reinventing Government. And that group has reconstituted itself and included me. I ran the network for them uh, back in the 90s. And uh, it's quite interesting that they're together. Well, in re thinking about reinventing government, uh, they got pretty stuck on what it could actually mean at this point. So talking around what we got to was the relationship of government to journalism and the press uh, was a critical element to rethink. So the question is how to do that. And we came to a model which is uh, in many ways overlaps what Pete's doing, but it's very different because of its simplicity. Uh, the idea is to create a resource for journalists uh, and uh, people and congressional staff that would be a web page across the top are the leading stories of the day. You click down to background stories of what's the immediate background to those stories. And then you click down further and you get the historical and sociological studies that are related. So that would be the day, all fitting on one page. Uh, the next day, there'd be another series of stories, probably some overlap, of course, with links back to previous days. So the idea would be that a reporter who's covering a story could go in there and immediately ground themselves down a couple of layers in order to do a better job with what they're doing. Uh, it's, it's, and they're really committed to doing this and uh, trying to raise money for it. So uh, that was a, a fat, that was yesterday, uh, an amazing outcome. Super interesting, Doug. Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks. I, real quick, I, I want to mention there's a, a thing called Help a Reporter out, H uh, A R O, and there's certain like source people, you know, librarians or specialists. Um, they they help reporters, um, and it's a pretty well-tuned system. Um, it's not dashboardy like the thing that Doug is describing. I like that the idea of that dashboard and the, the depth of it. Um, thank you. And let's go John Gill Stacy. Sorry to spring that on you, John. I typed it in the Adam Post <laughs> chat, but I'm not sure you're looking there. <laughs> All right. So this is a check-in. Yes? Yes. So I had a uh, rush with uh, COVID. Um, person I take care of got sick and his wife tested positive. And so I stopped the caregiving and he went into the hospital, He's still in the hospital. And his downstairs neighbor got tested positive and and I just got my results just minutes ago and they're negative. And so I'm like, you know, very <laughs> pleased, very grateful, but I would, I'm, I'm really struck, you know, I was struck by the contrast because, you know, just within four, 24 hours, I was watching the news, you know, I was seeing terrible things happening in Afghanistan, right? I mean, terrible things are happening everywhere, right? But then when something comes right, shoo, you know, this truck just glances off you and you're standing on the highway. It's, it's a very different experience. It's, it's much more like, whoa, you know, and then also just the arbitrariness. Um, the, the woman, well, the, the fact that this, my client's wife got it is kind of, you know, I mean, they live together and, you know, but his downstairs neighbor, you know, and she has Lyme disease. 
So she's got an impaired immune system. I'm like, this is so arbitrary. This is so unfair. <laughs> you know, I mean, I know life is unfair. I wasn't expecting life to be unfair. But when they when it just kind of comes and hits you in the face, you go, wow, you know, that is that is really bad. And I don't know that there's much I can do about it, except, you know, get better and then go back to helping people. But I, I'm still reeling from the, like I say, the impact of this and also the arbitrariness of it. So uh -huh. that's, a, that's enough of a check in. Uh, John, thank you. I'm glad, glad you tested negative. And yeah. I'm, you're reminding me that when SARS hit, um, I was actually living in Hong Kong briefly. And in Hong Kong, SARS, they discovered one building where there were a lot of cases. And strangely enough, the cases were all in like the F apartment on each floor. And they couldn't quite figure out what was going on. And it turned out that SARS droplets, when people flushed the toilet, SARS droplets were aerosolizing out of the, the, the water supply. Uh, and there was contagion up and down that particular pipe uh, in the building. And uh, now we've discovered that Delta variant is way more contagious than previous ones, uh, including strange cases of people just pass, it, it, never mind, you know, five or 15 minutes in a room together, but people passing each other in the hall as, as contagion vectors. So it's all bets are kind of weirdly off in different ways. Um, let's go Gil, Stacy, Doug. I think Gil wrote that he was gonna pass. Pass for I, I did. I just hadn't looked up. Um, thanks Gil. Uh, Stacy, Doug, Paul. Can I pass to Allison because I haven't met her and I'd love to know who she is. I was being gentle and letting Allison go late in the intros, but I'm happy to do that if you want. Allison, if you'd like to jump in and uh, possibly introduce us to your to your feline companion. Right. <laughs> the aggressive Amiri over here. Um, I am Allison, Lisa, um, and I'm friends. I was invited by Mark people. <laughs> Um, who is not here this morning. So I'm not sure why, but he, he told me about the group that invited me last night. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased to see Gil, who I've interacted with before and always enjoy following his conversations. And um, this is also interesting. So let's see. I guess my updates or um, a little bit about me is I have been working in the economics education space for a number of years and um, I'm very interested in how that narrative informs all that we do and think and see. Um, and my interests are in one, cultivating economic ecosystems and communities around the world, two, healing economic trauma, and three, designing um, strategies for economic drawdown, meaning sequestering that um, metastasizing money that is um, invested in the in the cloud and nothing meaningful basically and putting that into productive projects so as I enter right now I'm entering into my my school year um, I have a very strong sense of a mental health crisis amongst youth and I think that the way that we talk about things and the way that we dialogue um, the way that we inquire all contribute towards that, the way that we share news, the way that we frame our curiosity. Um, so anyway, I, I, here I am. <laughs> I'm happy to, to talk. But yeah. Nice to be here, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Could you just say a little bit more about mental health and kids? Just uh, uh, it could be about your your sort of perspective on it, or it could be what you're what you're seeing, or other sides to it. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Well, one of the things is um, it was about yeah, it was a number of years ago as as a teacher. By default, most economics teachers are teachers by default. Most have not been trained in economics, right? If somebody does any upper division training in economics, it's, it's probably because they're geared towards being finance in finance in Wall Street at whatever level, right? That's usually the crowd that's drawn in. So those who are tasked with teaching it at the high school level need to take some kind of training. The training happens to be dominated by neoliberal framework as is all of the curriculum. Um, coming into teaching economics by default 
and recognizing that simultaneously there was a mandate in the state of California to address the suicide crisis going on. Suicide is just one tiny symptom of a mental health crisis. It's just when it gets so bad, you're in a living hell and it's worth mm -hmm. taking your life. But in order to catch some of those, what the response was legally, um, each school needed to have a suicide prevention awareness program. And that meant a video and a survey to find out how often students are ideating suicide. And that was the extent of the response. The rest of the research that I would see um, addressing this growing crisis had to do with the amount of time young people are spending on their um, devices. And of course, there's a number of things that are toxic in that realm, for sure. The solution was to petition Apple designers to make less addictive telephones. So you see like the very, very, so for myself, I've been um, coming into, really, we've got to recognize economic trauma. Um, yeah, that and then coming out of COVID, there were more shootings uh, from the time students started back in school from March to the end of the year, which was part-time school. It was just a few months. And during that time, we had more shootings than we had had in 30 years. So we aren't, we're, um, yeah, it's, it's, a big, it's a big deal. And I do think that the way that we are unable to reconcile um, an economic system that is aligned with the patterns of nature and our own sense of sense of sense of what is good it um it creates some painful dissonance in our, in our thinking and our feeling and our interactions with one another as a society and it's interesting to me that it's, it's invisible it's nearly invisible yeah mm -hmm. and, Thank you, Alison. Um, and, and you raised a question in my head uh, along the way. You raised many, many questions, but one of them was, I wonder who has studied or written about neoliberalism, neoliberalism and mental health? Because there are many things about neoliberalism that lead to crises in mental health, just about the way it operates. And, but, I, but I don't, searching my memory, I can't think of somebody who's actually made those connections or, or teased that out or tried to find uh, uh, relationships or implications or things like that. If I could address it, I personally, I mean, I, I, I would like to see more attention than just myself, because usually I feel like I'm a harried mom, you know, and an unacknowledged school teacher. And in my free time, I'll try to get blogs out. So I've written something about adverse childhood experiences and trying to make the association between economic trauma. But I would hesitate to specifically bother with making a case about neoliberalism as an ideology that actually it's interesting because I um, there's a lot about the neoliberalism that feeds into the COVID philosophy and approach, right? Um, <clears throat> what's deeper there? And without having an ism or a set of beliefs that we're superimposing on an unexamined design, system design, right? But we, we have a system design that we're kind of treating as gravity and then, and then creating a translation. So there's a lot of interesting truths to neoliberalism that are unrecon unreconcilable within the system design and have a lot of negative outcomes, right? And so instead of blaming neoliberalism or focusing on that or pointing that and then immediately creating some kind of uh, again, a bifurcation of our, yeah, and, and further division of our discourse, then we can focus as designers on a solution-oriented approach and looking at, well, what, it, what are the main functions and what is it that we're going for? And I kind of think that that's an interesting conversation even to bring into the news and media space or the research space. We have to reckon, what is it that we're going for when we're looking to see what the what the covid responses are are because when we're coming in with our what is it that we're going for when we're looking for news reporting 
Can the news source actually say that? Could that affect the funding models? And how could that affect people's faith and trust for those news sources when we're explicit from the get-go about our own ob objectives, right? Agendas, objectives, yeah. So my agenda when I come into the classroom is to say, I'm, I'm wanting to understand what the major functions are and how the economy operates because what I'd like to see in society are peace in society, prosperity in communities, well-being in individuals, and regeneration in our environment. Those are my objectives. And if it gets us towards that, great. Let's keep looking at it like designers and thinking like designers. And that tends to feel like a productive approach. And when we take a solution-oriented productive approach towards envisioning something that we might want to see at the outcome, I think that has a massive impact on mental health. So instead of taking a pathological look, what does neoliberalism do? You know, further diverting our populace. What does neoliberalism do to harm our mental health? How about what does focusing on what brings us all together and what we might want do to improve our mental health? I don't think there's any time to waste being pathologizing anything right now. We have to have a salutogenic approach. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. That was really rich. I, I appreciate it. Um, Stacy, you uh, generously um, <laughs> ceded your spot there briefly. Would you like to step back in? I would love to. Thank you. Awesome. So I'm, ex I'm excited by a lot that I've heard. I'm really um, interested in Doug's project. I think that's exciting. I was excited to hear Bentley. Uh, I, now I'm like looking to see what it's going to look like when Bentley's bots add to Pete's um, project. One of the things that I noticed, though, because I had before I got on the call, I was watching uh, the Klaus's call. And one of the things I just want to point out is the um, difference between Pete's approach and I think it was Patricia. She didn't speak about it yet. It's for running a meet how she's going to run the meeting with the storytellers. And the reason I think that's important is because for Pete's project, his is like even the language and everything, it is perfect and tailored to people that are going to be working on the project. And then the way she did things, which, which it seemed to me bothered some people, is perfect for different kinds of projects. And Jerry, the more that you and I've been talking, and you know, especially with this idea of weaving the world, what I've realized is that what I'm focusing on is weaving the designers as opposed to weaving the, and those are two separate channels. So going back to the whole thing we've been talking about as far as a show and a video game in which we could actually create these things. Um, and and to, to Pete's point about actually doing, one thing that I would like to see done just as an exercise to do is to create our emoji that would go into a possible video and, and not our emoji, our avatar, our avatar, but our realistic court, like I use Bitmoji, you know, and somebody else might use something else. And then we could see the different, you know, like there's something there for the tech people to evaluate, which might be better. Anyway, I, I'm in too many directions already. But what I want to say is I'm really looking forward. There was somebody on the call on uh, classes called Joshua. Mm -hmm. If there's any <clears throat> way that I can get contact information, um, I'd really like to speak to him. And I'm really sorry that Hank's not here. His last name is Prieto, P-R-I-E-T-O. And I'll, I think I might have his email. I'll see if I can connect you to yeah. And I'm just excited. And Allison, it was, oh, that's what I wanted to say. Um, Barry had, had, uh, tagged me on something that I think is relevant. It was a, it was a quote by Dr. Glenn Doyle, who I didn't know who that was, but he said, don't est don't underestimate the power of fantasies and stories and characters to get you through a rough patch. It's more than just playing make-believe it's psychological and emotional survival. And it's not just for kids. And where that ties in is this whole idea of part of the educational software that I mentioned the other day and mental health 
Uh, it is a way to incorporate education with games, but in a way that's healing. So again, I'm interested in the mental health part of it, and I'm glad that Shimon, the psychiatrist, is actually on the call. Excellent, and we're, he's in the queue shortly. And I just put uh, Joshua's LinkedIn link oh, in the, in the Zoom chat. Thank um, you. So you can friend him up right there. Uh, let's go, Doug Paul Shimon. Okay, well, I talked about the project with reinventing government and journalism. Another project I'm involved with is with a group of economists. And the issue there really is, uh, since economics has, uh, as a discipline, has isolated itself so much from society, can it have any impact on the current problems around climate change? Uh, there is no worked out model as an alternative to neoliberalism, unfortunately. So there's no guidance as to what to do. Yes. Um, and uh, so I find myself in the middle of this, trying to figure out how to create conversations among people who are fairly narrowly educated in silos. So the first method question is, if you have two people with really interesting ideas and you put them together in a conversation, are they likely to turn more conservative in their own thinking or do they get stimulated by the thinking of the other and new things emerge? Uh, my view is if you put the people together, interesting things happen. So I'm trying to work out a model for that. Uh, we have uh, in this organization that I'm working with, there have been a number of really good podcasts uh, that are pretty strong. Uh, what nobody's ever done is put the podcasters together in a conversation. So yesterday, we made an agreement to take the top 10 podcasters dealing with economics and put them together in a common space and see what happens. And I think that's really pretty interesting. There's so many overlaps uh, with uh, what Sharon and uh, Allison have been saying that uh, could be a really long conversation, but I'll stop there. Yeah, that's great. I think Allison and Gil ha have seen working viable uh, alternate models. Allison, do you want to step in? I'd like to see to Gil first, if you'd like to speak. Um, however, I'm sharing a document. If you'd like to see, it's just a rough overview of what I call a relational design thinking process. And, um, and I, I really do think that the way that we think together and communicate together are important foundations to set in place before um, before going into a room to try to quote unquote solve problems or come up with solutions. Um, and I think that, that there are some assumptions that we have when we enter a classroom when we're talking about critical thinking. And some of those assumptions um, the result in, in ignoring that, that in order to think better together, communicate that we want to be in a place or really need to be in a place of optimal emotional well being. So we kind of enter into these spaces and we're already triggered or concerned on some levels and to what degree can we get our nervous system calmed. And so, and for that, I do a lot of to focus on um, noticing nature basically. You know, we have kind of a nature attention deficit disorder and that that is an important thing to be able to notice nature, not just because it calms our nervous systems, but because it also allows us to invoke the intelligence, the intelligent patterns of nature into our thinking you know, we sometimes don't even notice. And that's uh, mm -hmm. yes. So Allison, is the, no, that's okay. Um, is the relational design thinking process your creation and the, and I had to click uh, ask for access to the link. So you'll have to maybe change the settings or maybe you're going to get a flurry of, of requests for access right now. Um, but is this your invention? Because I think I think what Doug was stating was there's no commonly known <clears throat> alternative, which I which I think I also think is not necessarily true. But there's certainly I think I agree with the statement. There's no consensus alternative to the neoliberal agenda. That 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 the the ways to fix it haven't sort of converged in any way and may never. But uh, sorry, uh, Allison, is this is this your creation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. That is a that is a. Um... 
pretty obscure way of teaching. <laughs> it's a great way of teaching. I love, I love what you're saying. I love everything you're saying. I just wish more, you know, everybody knew about it. Solidarity Economy Network is one of the things that, you know, I think that throughout the world and throughout Latin America, there are a lot of agreements on how to approach economic solution making that definitely are divergent to the neoliberal paradigm, but because it's Latin America and Africa and these areas that aren't dominating our education spaces, but they're popular education spaces that they're not getting heard or seen by us. So it's really interesting too. I think what language or what funding is going on behind conversations has everything to do with whether or not we're paying attention to them and see that they're happening in big ways. So as they've been spending decades mapping out different strategies for um, solidarity economy efforts. So that's one thing. Thank you. Um, Gil, if you're in a place where you can speak, if you want to unmute, otherwise. Um... Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I will. I was trying to handle some householding this morning, but I'm just gonna have to surrender uh, <laughs> and, and come back here. Um, yeah, a bunch of comments, but first, Doug, could you clarify what you mean by no worked out model? Is it what Jerry said or is it something else? What do you, what do you mean by that? Well, there, there's no model of uh, production and distribution and relation to the broader society that is of a worked out enough to be operational. Okay. Uh, there are lots and lots of good small thinking, lots and lots of projects, but they don't cohere into an economy. Okay. All right, so I'm going to I'm going <clears> to <throat> interpret that back to you as not that there's a lack of models, but that the but that the dominant model is dominant and the others are peripheral and emergent, and <clears throat> perhaps experimental or perhaps not at scale. <clears throat> uh, you know, so at smaller scale, I think of the things that Stacy was talking about at medium, you know, larger scale, Hito Verde in Mexico, at larger scale, Mondragon in Spain at larger scale, the Scandinavian social democrat economies that are not as fully captured by neoliberalism uh, as the um, you know, UK, US axis and some of the rest of, 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 of Europe. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so yeah, clearly you know, we, are, we are in the grips of neoliberalism and have been for about the past 50 years and longer than that. And, and parallel to that, we're in the grips of what Hazel Henderson calls economism, where economics itself who was it? Uh, 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 was it Allison who talked about gravity? You know, it's a taken for granted as how the world is, and we've come to the point where economics is the lens through which we evaluate everything. Uh, and it's a reductionist economics, which makes it worse. But uh, uh, is there is there a, are there worked out models to a different way of living in the world and seeing everything through the lens of economics? I think you know not dominant, but there is very rich work, both theoretical and on the ground. And it very quickly takes us out of the realm of economics and into the realm of politics and power. Uh, so this is not a battle that's won intellectually only. It lives in really uh, in, in other realms. I'm sorry, I'm not very articulate here because I've got a slow start this morning. Um, but I, 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 I think, I want to challenge no worked out model as a way of characterizing it because I don't think it opens the doors that we want to open here. Well, it would be interesting to take something like Mondragon and see if it would scale up to a world economy. Uh, I've spent some time there and yeah. my conclusion would be no, uh, but I'm certainly open to conversation about it. Yeah, I, uh, how, how would we know, Doug? How, well, would we, how would we know if it could scale? I mean, it's obviously, it's rooted in ve some very characteristic local characteristics, I guess, but, you know, but, uh, uh, and it doesn't have to scale exactly the way it is, but the notion of a solidarity-based collaborative economic enterprise, uh, I don't know, there's a, I don't know if there's any theoretical reason why that can't scale. Can it scale successfully in this world where, you know, a concentrated neoliberal forces will quash it like it has done with other emergent experiments? Don't know. But that's not a theoretical refutation. That's a political refutation. Anyhow, I just, I, 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 don't, I don't know that we can debate it here, but I, I want to invite you to um, see if there's a different kind of characterization that might offer more 
emergent possibility than no worked out model because neoliberalism is winning at the moment. Feels a little circular to me. Um, and well, I, I'm, and well, doing, I, don't mean, I don't mean to be antagonistic about this at all. I'm just you know, really curious. I, 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 I honor your view, but I don't think the door is as closed as you're making it sound. Yeah, my thinking is often along the lines that you're on. So I, I agree most really with what you're saying. Part of the problem is how, what kind of post-neoliberal economics can pre- cope with climate change? Yeah, or, or pre-neoliberal economics. Yeah. I mean, look, we, you know, the, the ecological economists are taking a bite at that challenge of climate change with, um, you know, with, with natural capital and carbon pricing and so forth, um, which feel like really important defensive first aid actions. Um, here's where I agree with you, I guess, is that uh, those, feel, um, those feel like Band-Aids. I agree, totally agree. Not worked out models and they don't address the fundamental challenges of what's let's call neoliberalism and what I've been calling capitalism and what Hazel's calling economism, which is maybe more at the root. Um, because, uh, you know, we, even, even modern socialist economies to the extent that they exist are still in the grips of economists. Yep. And so we're talking about a multi, multi-value, multi-variant system which immediately presents us with the problem of how do we coordinate across human societies with multiple values in that society. One of the, one of the advantages of, of the neoliberal economistic approach is that if everything is reduced to the measure of money or the money of, of measure of finance, we have, we, have a, we, have, we have a lingua franca that the world can operate with. It may be blind in all kinds of ways. It may be stupid and suicidal in all kinds of ways, but at least we understand each other. And in the multiple model world, how do we understand each other and how do we coordinate across our multiple differences? These are big puzzles. Um, thanks, Gil. Um, uh, Allison, do you want to talk a little bit about economic drawdown and then John? Perfect, John. I'm just going to park it. <laughs> so pass it, John. Yes. Okay, yeah, this is, this is good. This is huge. I mean, what, the, what, you know, this conversation with Doug and, and Gil and Allison, you know, there's like, oh, so many places it could go and needs to go, needs to go. Uh, just one tiny little idea, and, and this is probably redundant for, for Gil and Doug, you know, it's, it's the idea of you could either think of it as a ratchet or as a sustainable Lego block. And it's the idea of, of course, we want to, dissuade the people who think, well, the only solution is airdrop bamboo trees, you know, and, and or or do geo engineering, you know, we, we, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. But we also at the other extreme, we don't want to take the people who say, well, look, I can, I can lower the carbon and increase the community of this community here with this combined transportation food, whatever plan. You say, okay, okay, would that be a sustainable Lego block? In other words, would, would whatever gains it gets be resilient enough to act as a floor from which you could build further? That, it's a different kind of question. You see, it's not, it's not is it the t- thing in the top of the drawdown list? No, it's not. No, we, the people who, are, who spend a lot of time thinking about this, we want to go for the top of the drawdown list or the the big changes, it, while understanding that politically, eh, you know, <laughs> you can't always do that. So we want to do what's si- strategically significant, what's politically possible, and maybe what, if you can't, you know, if you're boxed in too much by those, what would give you a sustainable Lego block, an improvement in a, in a particular region or community on some metrics that would likely create a floor it's, it's higher than where they are now, and it would allow you to p- potentially build up. I know that's a, it's tough to come up with those, but it's a possible way to think about it. Um, Doug, then me. Okay. Um, one of the problems that we're struggling with is very concrete, and that is we've got to cut CO2, uh, which means we've got to stop distributing the fossil fuels. And the problem is that any cut in the use of fossil fuels will lead to some, dis- some unemployment, uh, some slowing down of uh, corporate activity, uh, 
It means unemployment. It means mortgages not paid. It means banks failing. Uh, there's a cascading uh, series of events that follow from actually cutting uh, CO2. And yet we've got to do it. And nobody knows how to do that. Uh, there's no plan, uh, and that's a challenge, as to what are the first steps to actually cutting fossil fuel use. Um, so a couple things, and I'll pass it to you, Allison. Um, one, the three words I've heard kill more good ideas are it won't scale. And we have this sort of engineering mentality that we need to find the perfect answer, the best practices, whatever it might be, and then merely implement that with everybody, and then that'll be great. And we need a proof of scale in order to begin implementing kind of anything. And I think that that's sort of a flawed argument for how to move forward in the world. It could be that what scales is a whole bunch of different movements, all of which have shared goals and don't neutralize or counteract each other. And in fact, move us to, into some sort of new sets of new sets of economies that are not so tightly coupled that they can be taken down by John Paulson and Goldman Sachs and a couple other actors like the global financial crisis of 2008. Um, also, capitalism and ne the neoliberal, neoliberal flavor of it have so efficiently taken over our brains that we've forgotten that humans used to be like alive in the world really well. And if you go and read about pre-colonial Australia, North and South America, Charles Mann, the books 1491 and 1493, uh, the book Dark Emu and The Greatest uh, a state uh, about Australia, like humans were managing land masses without ownership of separate plots and they were thriving on the land masses. They were doing just fine. And the whole country, each of those continents was a forest orchard, was basically like what we're trying to do now with agroforestry, an exotic form of agriculture to do in little plots of land was in fact happening across the land. And, and, and like one method of economic distribution in the, in the Northeastern tribes of America, uh, the, uh, uh, basically the, the surplus of the hunter or the gatherer was kept in longhouses and the elder women of the tribe allocated it to whoever, whatever families needed it. And that's a, that's a method of allocation, right? And there's many others, but we've forgotten them all because we think everything has to have a price. And, and, um, and the last thing I'll say is, um, I wrote capitalism is a cuckoo, by which I, did, I don't mean capitalism is cuckoo, which is a statement I might agree with, but uh, cuckoos do not raise their own young. Cuckoos are brood parasites. Cuckoos lay their eggs in other birds' nests. And the first instinct of a cuckoo chick is to push everything else out of the nest. So a cuckoo chick is born and whatever else is in the nest, it backs up to it, shoves it out. If it's another egg, on the ground. If it's a live chick, on the ground. And then the robins come back and say, hey, Bobby's kind of big, but there we go, and start feeding the cuckoo and raise the cuckoo. Capitalism cannot coexist happily with other economic systems that take people out of the workforce, that take land out of the ability to buy and sell it, all those kinds of things. And as a result, it's kind of eaten our brains. We're not able to think about alternatives. There's no room, there's no oxygen in the room for alternatives. And we're busy thinking if something won't scale, that it's impossible. And that is a flaw in the conversation. So trying to figure out how to make multiple things flourish while figuring out how to move forward. And then we have conversations like decroissance, degrowth. Uh, we must stop the entire petroleum economy and stop all trucks from moving tomorrow and all that are all negatives. And those don't work because everybody's like, well, that seems impossible because we can't just stop all activity. And we haven't figured out how to pick up new activity. And in the meantime, we have climate disaster. And in the meantime, we have small experiments with things like basic income, which would in fact keep people going, which are just a band-aid over the longer problem, but we're not even paying attention to those. Most of the, uh, uh, most of the basic income experiments are either being shut down or being undermined in some way. So we don't have like consistent proof that even that's going to work well. Uh, although uh, you could argue that the relief packages during COVID have been a form of basic income and that they will be used as proof on a very large scale that, hey, look, this actually sort of worked. Um, Allison and then Gil. Sorry, Gil has his hand up, so I wanna see it to you again, Gil. <laughs> oh, stop it, Allison, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, but if I start going, pop in, okay? Because, I, because it's really fun conversation for me. This is juicy stuff. And, um, and I, yeah. I find that there are 
there's th there's still three things. So I want to come back to those three things which you refer to, Jerry, and I. And I, I think I read your piece or <laughs> seen another one using the cuckoo analogy, and I like it. Um, one is cultivating economic ecosystems. Two is economic healing, economic trauma, and three is economic drawdown. And um, I think that if we can focus on well, what does it mean to cultivate economic ecosystems, we start seeing that that is, you know, what are the basic functions of what we want to achieve here? And it's really fun to start thinking about that. You know, that's exciting already. Everybody's got these projects. You know, so, so drawdown it is filled with exciting ideas that are so inspiring. And, you know, the, the mystery is why aren't those scaling? And it's not much of a mystery. It's really the forces of where, how money moves and where it moves and, and why. And it's habitual movement. And so the, I think that the next fun, juicy part is when, especially the young people are coming up with designs within their community that they'd like to see, usually we have a good idea. And oftentimes the barrier tends to be some kind of money bottleneck, right? Well, God, I'd really like to do this amazing project, but how are we going to get the money? And, and so we have two, two bottlenecks there that are kind of happening with one another, and it has have to do with, well, understanding how does money work and what is the money for? And, uh, we, have a, we have a bottleneck. There's not a, a lot that's circulating that we have access to, and we have this huge amount that's kind of pouring other places. So on one hand, we get to create our own money to overcome that bottleneck. And then on the other hand, we get to sort of, we get to attract and draw down and sequester some of that money. That's really fundamentally, we have people who are just wanting to park their excess capital somewhere, right? We just need to park it somewhere. And we are getting more and more desperate to find safe places to put our money to secure a future. And, um, and, 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 and that's a, we really can do a lot, I think, to assure people who are having this problem. I don't happen to have that problem, unfortunately, or maybe that's, that's a lucky thing. I don't have to worry about that. Um, but where do we, how do we make that argument? And, and for myself, one of the approaches that I'm trying to take right now is in investing in land, which is one of the reasons why I got on the call and I spoke with Mark about that yesterday. Huh? Bonjour, Mark. <laughs> Come on okay, Investing yes. in what? I didn't hear the last word. Land. Investing in land. And land. Yeah. Sorry, um, Gil, I probably should have just ceded that to you. No, no, no. This is good. Then, you, 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 instead of ceding it to me, you've ceded it for me. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, investing in land, you and Bill Gates and China. And oh, see, we have to talk about that too. Yes. We, have a lot, we all have a lot to talk about here. Two things. This is, I mean, this is so rich and hard to keep track of all the threads here, but two things. Um, um, one is I, I'm, I'm enjoying, Doug, I'm enjoying sparring with you. We, we agree on so much. It's fun to find little disagreements to, to tussle over. Um, uh, Reducing carbon emissions is not the only thing that we have to do. It's one of the main things we have to do. And the other is that we have to in, in, enhance the ability of the soil sponge to absorb and hold carbon and absorb and hold water. Um, that's one example of many not negative, but positive things that we need to do. Allison's talked about a bunch of them. Uh, drawdown actually talks about a bunch of them. Many of the drawdown activities are stop doing this, but a lot of them are generate this and surprisingly, one of the most potent carbon impacts in their original model, I don't know what it's like in the revise, was uh, the educational status of women around the world as a cascading trigger uh, for a different kind of economic development that would draw down carbon. So it's a very, you know, it's a much more diverse territory than just stop fossil fuels, although clearly that industry uh, is, is dead man walking or needs to be. Um, <clears throat> The other thing on, on, on the business scale, I popped this in the chat, but it may have flipped by. When we talk about scale, we tend to talk about the Silicon Valley hockey stick model of scale. You know, endless exponential growth, although that doesn't live in the living world. We see sigmoids, not exponentials in the living world. Um, but there's another kind of scale, which I think is the reason for OGM, and I think is why I'm here, is the horizontal, what I call the horizontal scale of the federated small. Yeah. How do we do lots of small stuff across the planet and link it together 
in horizontal, not, not dominant hierarchy kind of models to enable them to be effective and to compete effectively with the massive scale of the big dogs. Um, and is that a worked out model? Probably not, but it's an emergent model. Uh, it smells to me like there's something very real and powerful there. Uh, um, it seems to me that a lot, of the, a lot of what OGM is up to is about that in various ways, about how to enrich and increase the capability of not just decentralized, but federated or somehow collaboratively coordinated, intertwingled uh, independent small stuff. So that Flotillas like, of entities, you could say. Say it again? Flotillas of entities, you could call them perhaps. Or... Could perhaps, maybe, I don't know. Or swarms. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, it, it seems to me that this is the sort of thing, you know, it, it's, not a, it's not a worked out model and it will not be until it wins. Uh, and you won't know when, that it's winning until it wins and you won't see it coming, which is maybe an advantage as well as a disadvantage. You know, the, 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 the Chile experiments under Allende and Nicaragua under the Sandinistas and others got stomped. You know, if there's an emergent model that looks powerful, it gets stomped. If it's an emergent model that's invisible, um, it's harder to stop. And um, anyway, you know, and we move into the realm of, of ministry for the future and other kind of speculative fiction explorations of this, but we're, we're how to say this, we are arguably moving into a situation of such instability uh, globally that big changes can happen quickly. That's not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> Jerry, I'm gonna wear out your fingers. <laughs> I, you are, you are, but I'm happy, like, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, I'm with yeah, you. So, I'm so, you. So, you know, how do, we, how do we nurture these diverse emergent models so that um, in a way that increases their potential to suddenly grow in scale and impact when the destabilizing conditions permit that? Right. Typically what happens in that story is that a strong man comes in and says, okay, I'm gonna fix everything now. You, you all calm down. Um, hopefully something else or many something else's can happen in that situation. So um, um, uh, Doug, a thank you back to you because I've been feeling pretty dark this week with the, you know, with the IPCC report coming out and other things. Dark, dark but not, not hopeless, dark and determined. Uh, but having this conversation brings me back to the richness of this moment and, you know, maybe long odds, but very real possibilities of something else emerging. And I'll um, stop. Thanks, Gil. And thanks, everyone. This has been a really rich conversation. And I, I want to uh, sort of gently bring us back to the check-in round because we've done only a few. Um, I did want to add one thing to the conversation that just came up from what you were saying, Gil, which is I just wrote in the Mattermost chat that tight coupling makes large scale failures more possible or probable. And the case study for me is Argentina. I grew up partly in Argentina <clears throat> and poor Argentines, like really like they're more arrogant than your average South American or human, but they did nothing to deserve the economic shithole that they're in right now. And part of the problem was in the 90s and the 80s, they were the, the poster child of the IMF and the World Bank. They privatized everything, sold everything off. Uh, everybody's bank accounts around the world were kind of pickpocketed by the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009. And because everything is coupled to the dollar in the world economy is sort of linked, linked globally, they're, they have no assets. There's, there's, you know, uh, what the, all they can do is like try to renationalize the petroleum company, YPF, uh, YPF, or, or whatever else. And then it's like, oh my God, they nationalized, but, but you know, they're done. They, they, they got rid of everything and there's nothing left in the country uh, to basically bootstrap with. Um, so, so it's chaos. And decoupling, uh, the ability to sort of intentionally buffer and create separate currency systems that aren't all linked together so that when somebody figures out how to crack the code, on, on you know, disturbing the currency system, everybody suffers. I think that's really important in our future. And then we may have a future with many different kinds of regimes that are overlapping and that have intersections and exchanges of value in lots of different ways and currencies. I don't know, and I would not be afraid of that future. Like to me, it's not, is Bitcoin gonna own the world and then we transfer the entire economy from the dollar to the Bitcoin. Uh, to me, it's like, what, what variety of, of rich flavors can we actually move toward? 
Um, you, said, you said the word, you said the term loosely coupled systems. And yeah. I think it's a very important one for us to just kind of put a pin in. Um, th and thanks for sharing that article in the chat. Yeah, I, I haven't seen it. Um, fabulous. Let's go to Paul, Shimon, and Tony. Tony. Um, this is all very interesting because um, it's been a very productive morning just listening here because I went into this meeting pretty much in limbo and not thinking I was going to say anything. Um, it's been hot here in Northern California, usually over like 105 almost every single day. So we spend most of our time inside. Uh, we just retired, so we don't have teaching and it's real easy just to kind of float off into a cloud. And in the last few days, it's gotten smoky, so we're inside even more. So I've just been sort of in my own mind. And right now I'm lying in bed. I'm not camping. I'm <laughs> lying sideways on my bed, so I keep moving my computer back and forth. But um, as I've been listening to this conversation, it, it turns out that what I've been thinking about is what you've all been thinking about, too. Um, and so one of the things I've been thinking about is the this whole profit-driven economy. That's how I'm kind of thinking of it, where most people, you get your money by working for some, some organization that somehow has to create a profit somewhere to be able to make the money to pay salaries. And we're all tied into this need for a profit and almost everything that the world needs right now does not generate a profit in an economic sense it's it's work that uh, you know it's primordial work it's the work of beaver and earthworms and salmon and and you can't justify it economically and so um i i just see this situation where the systems that we have for making change are never going to are always going to be behind the curve they're going to do too, too little too late <laughs> and that uh, the just it seems like a lot of the conversation i hear out in the world not here but uh, out in the world it's just um pie in the sky is too demeaning but it's just not grappling with the reality of like the Paradise Fire that happened here two years ago, and suddenly you have ten or twenty thousand people homeless, and where do you find a space? And they all moved down to Chico, and after about a year, people who had fire insurance could kind of get back on the feet, but the other five or ten thousand people slip into the what Chico would call homeless people, and they are just. And now they're lost and they're and they're despised when they had sympathy two years ago. So um, where am I going with this? Um, and then people have been mentioning about scaling up and uh, Alicia and I, we created Chrysalis Charter School, which is a small charter school. <clears throat> and we keep hearing people around about, well, can you scale it up? And there's all this in... in uh, Emphasis, emphasis on scaling up. And we, we, we had no desire to scale up. The whole idea is a small school. That's the essential part about it. And to scale up means, okay, you're going to take this model and impose it on other places. I mean, I guess scaling up for us would be, we're a teacher-powered school. We're one of the vanguards of that. And the idea of teacher power schools, the teachers decide what they're going to, how the school is going to run. So if you want to scale that up, that's giving teachers the power to shape the school. And that's not really scaling up. I think that's what like Gil's talking about. It's not scaling up. It's, it's giving this, it, it's fertilizing the ground around you so that other mushrooms can grow. Um, so there's that. And I'll stop there. Um, Paul, thank you. That was a, a, thank you for your lovely check-in. Um, would you mind if somebody borrowed those ideas from your school? And do you do anything to make the ideas easier to borrow and adapt to other situations? Uh, yeah, we uh, there's a teacher-powered school uh, consortium out there, and uh, we didn't know about the phrase teacher powered school, we use the phrase teacher autonomy. And uh, 
we just got sent a survey about five or 10 years ago looking for teacher powered schools and we responded and they go, wow, you are about the most far out school in the country that you have every single autonomy that we imagine. And they came and interviewed us and Alicia has been ambassador with them. And so there is that teacher powered school movement and we definitely have been part of that. Well, thank you. And a friend of many of ours, Arthur Brock, long ago uh, was the headmaster of the Manhattan Democratic Free School and then separately had invented a bunch of advanced sort of learning environment stuff and has put an open source design for um, uh, agile learning centers, ALCs, I think. I'll find the link. This, is, it, pardon? this, is, this is so weird. Yeah. You mentioned Art Brock, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and he's, <laughs> he's in my world too. I, I, can't, I can't figure out the guy. He's all over the place. And uh, he, he just arranged for me to be interviewed by another friend of his, Katie Teague, and, and that's on YouTube now. But it's just, you, you hit people like Art, and you go, man, this world is really, <laughs> the mycelia that are working in this world are really fantastic. It is. And, but partly, Art is the reason I know you, Paul, is that years ago, Art's Art is the one who sent me the video to your upward spiral um, conversation over the hillsides of central California. Um, so I think there's lot, lots of lots of binding mycelial, uh, you know, hyphae here. Um, and and our, Arthur is, I think, a genius and is also busy trying to do Holochain and a bunch of other initiatives in, in this world. But, um, but I think making good ideas more shareable and more adaptable and appropriable, I think is super important in these scripts really, really vitally, centrally important. So, so Pete, when you're doing emergent event sense making, a piece of me is listening to that going, how do we watch an emerging event and connect it to wisdom from what people have learned about pandemics and vaccines, what people have learned about temporary shelter for the Paradise Fire, what people have learned, like, like there's a whole bunch of stuff that if we told better stories and made the information easier to find and use, just easier to find and use, damn it, um, we could solve a whole lot of problems by letting people go figure it out on their own on the ground. They just haven't heard these stories and they don't know what to do. And they're being told that FEMA is going to come in and solve everything, but it doesn't. They're being told that they now have no life savings and they're, you know, good luck to you because we have a bad social, whatever. But, but I think that the replicability and adaptability of stories is hugely important. Sorry for the, the, the long, longer riff than I intended there. Um, let's go Shimon, Tony, Michael. Yeah, hi. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. It's like hard for me to sort of like hold back as many of the questions and very meaningful discussions are areas that I'm actually working on. So to Doug's point about the government and the media, I actually have been working on for quite a while on the opiate epidemic, which touches on what Allison was talking about. Uh, in terms of despair. Now, in terms of the opiate epidemic and government, it's and also COVID, it's very intriguing to think about how some of the information initially, and it goes back to January 17th of last year from CDC, got communicated through the media and how it got co-opted. So one of the projects that I'm working on and actually sort of like diverted my interest in the opiate epidemic was on a citizens commission for COVID-19. And there I actually examined the role of the media, thinking about how to incorporate Wikipedia, how to think about C-SPAN. There's a lot of initiatives going on about public media, about local media, and various other topics. If anyone is interested in that aspect about media and uh, COVID-19 and forums associated with misinformation, that's really important piece. I have gotten back to the opiate epidemic because as uh, Allison was talking about, I think that one of the major crises we face is a crisis of meaning right now. And I was very intrigued to hear her use uh, the term salutogenesis Salutogenesis is actually a term that I, uh, actually my mentor in medical school coined, and I'm actually in the process of 
formulating and proposing a center for salutogenesis, which I'm trying to get into my medical school. I just actually presented at the International Conference on Salutogenesis about the opiate epidemic, diseases of despair, post-COVID, you know, essentially economic challenges and salutogenic approach. So I have a whole lot of information about strategies to approach uh, aspects of uh, despair and things of that kind. Uh, tomorrow or today, actually, there's going to be a probably resolution of the Purdue Sackler, you know, opiate, uh, I guess, trajectory of the last 20 years. I personally think, and there's a number of others who have written about it, that uh, it, the Sacklers have been pretty much scapegoated, not that they were not responsible, but this is to the, uh, to the point of capitalism, neoliberalism. I think that by understanding the process from like 1995 all the way to now, we have a much better case understanding of how neoliberalism has really contributed to where we are today with the opiate crisis of like 500,000, 600,000 people dead, but more importantly, people suffering from unemployment and marginalization, alienation. And in my take on it and some other people that are writing about it, it's certainly a way to divert attention from what neoliberalism has done and by, in my opinion, by sort of like opening up as a case and looking at who can we understand all the stakeholder within this ecosystem and how to approach them, I think is really crucial. And I think it does have a salutogenic understanding. I'm actually very interested in education. I think a very important antidote to what we're dealing with is give kids dignity and purpose. And the way to do it is getting them at different stages of development to understand how they fit into their environment, whether it's in their home, their locality, their state or whatever, and also giving them tools. So one more thing, one more last thing, my efforts are directed to 2026, which is going to be the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And that is certainly something to hopefully re allow us, us to re-examine where we are as citizens. And I'm hoping through some of these activities of citizen commissions, uh, there's a whole concept of sortition, case presentation. I think we can really make a meaningful impact on where we are as citizens. So I'm beyond liberalism, conservatism. I'm much more into citizenism. What does it mean to be a citizen? And actually that's what my project is called. And anyone who's interested in that, I can share a link with you on that. Shimon, thank you very much. <clears throat> that's, I, I love how all these threads fit together. Um, let's go Tony Michael Mark. Hi, uh, my project is to, um, well, a ways back, Derek Cabrera and his wife, Laura, and uh, Gerald Midgley and uh, Benjamin Taylor and some others came, had a present, did a presentation. And it was, they said an astounding, I thought it was a very astounding fact that uh, no unified approach to syst how to actually do hands-on, do systems thinking has ever been articulated. And, I, and I'm saying, well, gee, it was all, uh, you know, 400 page books I looked at. And yet when it gets right down to it, those books talk about things about systems thinking, but they're not prescriptive. They're not talking about how to actually do systems thinking. Big difference. Uh, I've, had, I've, I've worked in aerospace. I got hands on experience actually doing it. So I came I was going to do it for a local school around here is uh, STEM day. Uh, uh, but uh, that got canceled to do the COVID. But anyways, uh, the whole concept of using videos. Uh, the, uh, the hypothetical Carol's candy store, two person store, Carol makes candy. She inputs this, she outputs that. She, this here's, here's how we construct the model and everything else like that. It could be very, it's, it's relatively easy to do. And I've, I've, I've done that uh, primarily, uh, I figured a STEM audience, a lot of schools, uh, STEM is a big, huge thing here in Ohio. I don't know if people are familiar with it, but it's a big, big application. And um, uh, there's also, I could, uh, there's a variety of products that could stem from this basic approach of using videos with dynamic 
pointers and stuff like that to explain certain things that can't be done as static pictures. Um, so I guess that's what I got. I'm in the process of getting a R and D grant to made through the initial phases of getting R and D money for it. Um, that's all. Um, thanks, Tony. Just a small side thing. There's an interesting, a guy named Sankey created a, a way of modeling the economy years ago as flows of water. It's called a Sankey diagram. And that's What's interesting. S-A-N-K-E-Y. S-A-N-K-E-Y, thank you. S is in Sam. Uh, we, will put, we, will, we will put links to it in the, in the, in the chats. <laughs> since, since we're busy like multi-posting and multi-chats right now. Allison, go ahead. Well, um, another thing that I threw into the chat, so I'll go ahead and just restate it in case it was missed. because there's so many neat alignments here. Um, when it comes to systems thinking, a video and pointing is one way. Um, I do think that systems are complex and are really described by relationships. That's, that's the space in between and the, the flows of an economic system and understanding the flows is one of the best ways to understand systems thinking, but also what is constructive about that relationship building and that system understanding and where are we going with it as we're practicing. And so I, I do feel like I'm blessed to be able to be in a classroom with students for 36 weeks, right? And so if there's um, R&D, that you're getting funding for, for teaching systems thinking. I would really welcome talking about that, you know, as far as understanding, researching and designing how we impact our, our mental health perspectives, right? And those systems in the understanding of systems and how we can align those two and, our, and, and how we are part of natural systems ourselves. So there's something that I, called nature attention deficit disorder. And I was um, really delighted to see that there is <clears throat> a group, um, I think it's out of Cornell maybe, that is focusing on peace attention deficit disorder. And I thought that was just really exciting that this is becoming a focus that we're looking at peace as not just the absence of violence. Um, there, I guess there's there's continues to be a, a lot to say, but but at what point, you know, as um, all of us are doing different things, would we like to harness some of our energies towards seeing a beneficial impact by training teachers to understand how to incorporate the wisdom or or go through nature. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm working with a Spanish speaking community. I'm really blessed to have Spanish skills. It's so much fun and it's so nice to be able to speak um, directly to the hearts and minds of folks over the radio about the importance of alternative economics and provide hope. And I got a bunch of phone calls saying, talking about mental health issues and get to do um, a course with some some, some folks of local here, I'm in the Santa Rosa area, and, and work on creating economic ecosystems as communities and how we build those out and how that feels like it's healing on some of the deepest level of some of our right? Um, and, and then what will result is a little bit more of an experience of prosperity because that's that that social isolation is crazy making, really crazy making. And our scarcity limits our thinking and our bandwidth. And so we, like you were kind of saying, it takes the air out of the room, right? And you can't really think clearly. So anyway, I would, I, I think that there's a lot, a lot of potential here to support what it is that we're talking about and being able to develop models through the churches, through the schools, having economic games that can teach systems thinking and flows and come up with the alternatives simultaneously. So that's um, plus, anyway. Thanks, Allison. Um, 
uh, I think, uh, Michael, you might get the last check-in of the day. I just realized what the time is. So um, my apologies, but um, jump on in. Um, I'll, I'll make it very quick then. So maybe somebody else can squeeze in. I'm, I'm just really, really enjoying. This is one of those conversations where I'm just glad to be here and, uh, and be listening particularly to you know, people who are, are so much smarter than I am on so many subjects. So I'll, I'll let you guys talk. <laughs> um, Mark, would you like to jump in? I'm sorry I missed the uh, beginning and I'm so happy that Alison uh, showed up this morning. No, I don't have anything to say. I'm just like, I'm happy to see all these beautiful faces here. And, uh, the conversation has been steering in the right direction. Awesome. Um, how about Bentley then, Vincent? Uh, I've probably talked a lot. Let's let Vince go first. If he doesn't pick up or if he doesn't pop on, I can certainly plug Golvibot again. Awesome. Vincent, are you, Vincent. Are, you, are you there? Paging Vincent, please pick up a white courtesy <laughs> telephone. <laughs> Hello, this is the operator connecting you to Vincent. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know if I could summarize in a minute, but... Uh, <laughs> um, we just created a discord for um, the kind of catalyst commons is the name. And uh, I just wanted to share a kind of um, pattern um, with that is um, that the analogy that I'm using is um, so I feel like the collective sense commons is like a really rich, like complex with like loads of different rooms. Um, it's like a giant building. And, uh, and so Trove had like one kind of small room um, where we were chatting. In, in the collective sense um, commons. And I um, was saying, yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, when you're like a teenager and you're like, you know, being super loud in your bedroom and you're like, oh, well, the walls are really thin. I think I need to like move out. Um, so I think this like pattern of like, okay, I think we've like outgrown this room. We need to create another space. But I think we should like leave our childhood room there with our stuff and we should come back and visit all the time. And I think all of us having like different channels that have like rooms that connect to each other's uh, communities seems like a really cool pattern. So for example, within the Catalyst Discord, I'm hoping to have rooms for whatever groups are on Trove that want to basically boost into that. And, um, and then if you, you know, go into that discord, then they might have rooms for all the different groups that they're connected to. And so it's a way to kind of like connect across these different platforms. So we don't have total silos. And I think this was mentioned by someone in the um, building OGM call yesterday that I listened to on YouTube. So um, yeah, I'm going to post a link in the chat and in the, uh, um, in the collective sense comments too, if anyone wants to join. Sounds great. Um... Vincent, thank you. And somehow, miraculously, we actually, I think everybody had a chance to, to check in. Um, any closing thoughts by anyone before we wrap this call? It's been a great call for me too, thank you. I have one question. Wait, 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 I have one question only because we focus on words a lot. Is there another word that could be substituted for neoliberalism? Because, yeah, I just want to know if there's, if there's possibly another word, I just, I'm going to recommend that for a zillion different reasons that I don't want to explain. Right, anybody? Some people call it late capitalism. I think that's a much better idea. <laughs> Crap, capitalism. What, did, what would you say? Crap. 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 Capitalism, <laughs> that may not work as well. It, it's, it's also say capitalism too, yeah. It's also related a lot to globalization. Um, libertarianism that's a piece <laughs> of it yeah it's, but it's not all libertarian no. if it could be something that's not attached to something else that would be good not everything is attached to everything yeah. Susan. Hmm. no but i mean you hear libertarianism and you're thinking of a person if it could not be attached in that way like a little bit more um I think well, it's not attached in some way people won't understand what you're saying well, but in a way, that's a positive because then they don't get defensive if it attacks some of their ideas that they hold tightly. You're looking for cleaner language, I think. Allison? 
I've just deleted the isms as much as I can from my discourse and look at it as design, system design. But, you know, so, so if, you're if we're talking about an economy, we do have the dominant economy. We, we could say a dominant economy dominant and not economy. necessarily have that be a value judgment about it being dominating, although it is. And I, and I go the other way, Allison. I've added the ism and I, I'm now always writing capitalism with a hyphen. Mm -hmm. oh, so, yeah. so, okay. To, Just to, 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 emphasize, to emphasize that it that it's a system that fetishizes capital. Yes. Yeah. Nice. For everyone's amusement, this is capital. This is isms in my brain. Everything oh. from <laughs> altruism to careerism to citizenism. <clears throat> Shimon, you're here. Uh, to Clintonism, centrism, catastrophism, and this is just A through C. You'll notice there's a <laughs> scroll bar down here. So Jerry, if I scroll, where, where's, where's carnivorism? I don't know. I'll, if it's not there, I'll put it in. But you have you have cannibalism, so that's good. Yeah, I've got cannibalism for sure. Uh, Garveyism, Gaulism. Please, please, please laterally connect that to capitalism. Yeah. Oh go. my God, you have Gaulism. <laughs> now what? It's Gaulism. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, Charles de Gaulle. Charles. It's good old Charles. People, <laughs> people following Charles de Gaulle, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll put this link in the, in the Mattermost chat. And with that, I think I'll stop the sharing. And thank you all for a great call. It's been really me, fun. Give me a minute to save the chat. Uh, yes, the Done. chat. Most of this, most of the Zoom chat is replicated in the Mattermost chat, which you can go to for all these links. I think I don't. I don't know that there's much of a link that showed up here that wasn't replicated in the in the Mattermost. So, okay. thanks everybody. Thanks everybody.